Oop, not that. Don't look at that. Close that. Open that. Okay. So chapter 18, it begins with the pump, right? The heart. And then we put that pump together with the vessels and the blood and some of the other systems of the body. And we'll start to see <clears throat> how cardiovascular function actually occurs and then is changed to meet the body's needs. But we start out talking about that pump in our chest. Um, the location of the heart, I'm going to turn those lights off, is, you know, when we're taught in elementary school to put our hands on our hearts, we're way over to the left of where the heart actually is. The heart's in the center of the chest. It just leans to the left, okay? So it's a midline organ that has a point that points sort of parallel to the contour of the lower rib cage um, over to the left. <clears throat> and as we'll see in some better pictures in a minute, the human heart has rotated to the left. In other words, the, the right side of the heart is sort of in the front, and the left side of the heart is sort of in the back. And I've got a better picture of that in a minute, and I'll tell you why that's the case. But So when you look at the heart in the chest like this, most of what you see is actually the right side of the heart. So this is the right ventricle. This is the right atrium. And then we see a little bit of the left ventricle off to the left-hand side. All right. And for some reason, which I don't know, but it's always been the case, we refer to the heart in kind of an opposite way. So typically, when you think of the apex of a thing, you think of its highest point, right? In the heart, the apex is the pointy part, okay? So the apex of the heart actually points down and to the left. The base of the heart is right here where the atria lie. So the base is at the top, the apex is at the bottom. So a little bit confusing, but it has to do with its shape, not its orientation in the body. Okay, so better pictures to come. But first a little, we call this histology or microscopic anatomy. How are the cells arranged in the heart? And just like the blood vessels, there are three layers. Remember, blood vessels, you had the tunica intima, media, and externa. Well, in the developing um, embryo, the heart actually develops from a blood vessel, from the arteries. So it, too, has three layers, but the layers look quite a bit different. Okay, so on the in inside of the heart, lining the chambers, we have what's called the endocardium. The endocardium has endothelium on it. Endothelium is the same thing that lines the inside of blood vessels, right? So that Teflon coating is continuous from the inside of vessels to the inside of the heart. So it's one continuous Teflon coating, so to speak, to keep things nice and slippery. Because the heart, unlike a vessel that is a nice tube shape, the heart has a really complex three-dimensional shape. So blood would have a tendency to clot in the heart if it wasn't for that endothelium lining, endothelial lining, keeping everything nice and smooth. Okay, so that's the innermost lining. Then we have the big, thick, muscular part of the heart. Um, that's the myocardium. So if you take a heart out and you put it on a scale, most of the weight of the heart is this muscle tissue, the myocardium, the actual contracting parts of the heart. So most of what we talk about when we talk about the heart is actually the myocardium because it's where all the work gets done. And then the outermost surface of the heart, so this surface you're looking at right here, has a slick, smooth lining called the epicardium. Epi just means outside, so this is the outermost layer. And just like the endothelium, <clears throat> it's a single uh, cell layer thick. So we've got some more of those squamous epithelial cells that you learned about last semester. And then the heart sits in a bag, <clears throat> and that bag is called the pericardial sac. Now, in this picture, that bag has been cut away in the front. But do you see these little tongs here that are pulling on something? They're pulling on the bag that the heart lives in, okay? So <clears throat> we're going to talk more about that bag in a minute. But um, 
So we'll come back to that. So the heart lives in a bag so that it can move independently of its surroundings. Okay, so three layers of the heart. <clears throat> heart muscle. Did you talk about cardiac muscle cells last semester at all? A little bit, maybe? A tiny bit, okay. I know you talked a lot about skeletal muscle, though, right? Striations, um, long strings of, of sarcomeres and myofibrils, parallel bundles, right? Um, skeletal muscle cells are really multinucleated giant cells, right? You know, they're like 100 cells all squished together into one giant massive cell. Well, cardiac muscle shares some of the characteristics of skeletal muscle, and it has some of its own characteristics and it shares some characteristics with smooth muscle. Um, <clears throat> so the things it shares with skeletal muscle are myofibrils, sarcomeres, and striation. In other words, that complicated sarcomere structure that you learned about, you know, with the M line and the Z line and the thin filaments and the thick filaments, the heart has those two. And while the myosin and actin are of a little different flavor, it's all put together in the same way. Okay, so what you learned about the sarcomere shortening in response to calcium being present, remember troponin, tropomyosin, the, actin, the myosin heads pivot on actin and make contraction. All those same things happen in the heart. It's just they have the, the heart has its own version of those proteins. So like there's cardiac myosin, cardiac actin, tropomyosin, troponin. Okay, but it's the same, same function, just a little bit different molecule. Okay, so you see that, you know, here's the sarcomere, so that should look familiar, right? Thin filaments, thick filaments, um, and then they're connected in the center by the Z line, right? And you've got the M line um, down through the center of here. So we have all those things. <clears throat> in uh, cardiac muscle cells share some things with smooth muscle too. One is they're much smaller cells than skeletal muscle. They are classic cells in that they have only one nucleus, and that nucleus is sort of central, okay? So it's, they don't have a bunch of nuclei. Um, and uh, they are connected in part by gap junctions. Okay, so we talked about gap junctions in the endocrine chapter. <clears throat> so here we have heart cell. Here we have heart cell. So the heart is essentially semi-spherical. In other words, it takes up a volume like a balloon does. Okay, It contains a volume. So in order to push blood out of it, it has to contract around that volume to create pressure to push blood out. Well, as it contracts around that volume of blood, the cells are being pulled apart. Right, because there's blood inside, and physics says that an object or a thing doesn't want to move unless it's pushed on. So the heart is pushing around this blood, which means it's being pulled apart a little bit. So in order to have all these heart cells stay stuck together and be strong, they need to have a couple of different kinds of connections. And the connections between a heart cell are called intercalated discs. And they're very strong junctions, one of the strongest junctions in the body. So a heart cell will tear before it will separate from its neighbor. Okay, so that's how strong these junctions are. It's a little bit like some of the ligaments in the body. The bones will break before the ligaments will tear apart. Well, in these intercalated discs, there are two important junctions that I want you to know. The first, you've heard about already. So we have these little straws called gap junctions. Gap junctions allow small molecules to go from one cell to another. Probably the major player in the heart is calcium, because calcium causes heart muscle to contract, just like it does in skeletal muscle. Remember, skeletal muscle contracts when calcium is released on the inside. Same process in the cardiac muscle, just a different mechanism for getting there. Okay, so calcium can cross through the gap junctions and move from cell to cell. 
Now, this is hugely important because it means that when this cell contracts, the calcium inside it moves to the next cell and causes its neighbor to contract. Because ultimately, we need all the cells of the heart to contract at the same time. If we have a cell contracting here and a cell relaxing here, the heart's not going to get smaller, right? It's just going to change shape, but it's not going to get smaller. So gap junctions allow for what we call a, um, a syncytium. Is that in here somewhere? Probably not. What is, where is it? Yes, there. I don't have to write it. Great Scrabble word, right? Two Ys, not very many vowels. Syncytium. So a syncytium is a group of cells that work together. Technically, it's any group of things that work together. You know, so if you were all to grab hold of ropes and pull some heavy object, you too would be a functional syncytium, right? Because you're a group of things working together. <clears throat> but in this case, a syncytium means that even though these are separate cells, they work as one. So when they contract, they all contract together. So they do all the work at the same time. And the syncytium is pretty much because of these gap junctions and how calcium can move from one cell to the next. So that sets up the communication. That gets all the heart muscle cells working together. But we still have this problem of being pulled apart. Well, there's a uh, um, connection for that, too. And that's called, doo -doo, doo -doo, this is a desmosome. And you can think of a desmosome as a nut and bolt, right? You know, if you've got two pieces of wood and you put a, a bolt through it and you screw a nut on the other end, they're stuck together, right? Well, a desmosome works in that same way. It has a flat end on the inside of each cell. It has a bar that connects the two cells. And that keeps these cells from being pulled apart, okay? So it's like a fastener. It, it holds the two cells together. Now, this is hugely simplified. I've shown one of each. There's thousands of each between each two cardiac muscle cells. And that organization, it looks a little bit like this. So we have these little pits and valleys. Instead of being smooth, it's wrinkly. Two wrinkled things that fit together can hold better than two smooth things can, right? Because there's more surface area between them. So there's more desmosomes, there's more gap junctions because of this wrinkled um, appearance here. So what that looks like under the microscope is like this. This is an intercalated disc. This is one cardiac muscle cell here. Here's another. And then here's the one it's joining to. There are the nuclei, right? So many of the structures we see in our uh, diagram, we can see in the microscope picture too. Another thing I want you to see, do you see how this uh, branches? We start as one group of fibers and we end up with two. This is another difference between skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. Cardiac muscle branches. It kind of has to because there would be no way to make a heart from parallel bundles because the heart isn't that uh, regular in shape. So the, the fibers have to they, um, divide. So they divide and they do the opposite. Two bundles will come together and form one bundle too. So where <clears throat> skeletal muscle looks like this, right? Cardiac muscle looks like this. It branches, right? And then it comes back together at the other end. <clears throat> so we get these branching um, sarcomeres, these branching uh, chains of cardiac muscle cells. All right. So it's only cardiac muscle has intercalated disc, and only cardiac muscle branches and comes back together. So like if somebody gave you a microscope slide and said, is this skeletal muscle or is this cardiac muscle? Well, some clues. We have one nuclei per cell, so that suggests it's cardiac muscle. We have these intercalated discs, which admittedly don't show as good on the projector as they do on my screen, but you can see them on your screens. And then uh, the fibers branch. So those are all characteristics of cardiac muscle and no other kind of muscle. So it's a way to identify those. All right. <coughs> okay, so if we zoom back out and we look at the heart 
in the chest, you can see a number of important things. Okay, so the first is the center of the chest is, see how this is sort of a square? In real life, it's more of a column, right? Because it has a three-dimensional shape. So it's like a cylinder that goes down through the center of the chest. And it is one of the busiest places in the body in terms of anatomy. You've got a ton of stuff that exists in this region. So we give it a special name. We call this the mediastinum, is this, co or this column, this cylinder that goes from the neck all the way down to the diaphragm, okay? So what's in there? Well, the thyroid gland is in there, up in the neck. The trachea, carrying air down to the lungs. The great vessels, so here's the aorta, here's its branches. Here's the superior vena cava coming up and its branches. The inferior vena cava is down here behind the heart. Okay, the descending aorta is also behind the heart, but still in the mediastinum. Behind the trachea is the esophagus, carrying food and, and drink from the mouth down into the stomach. So the mediastinum, that's this region right here, has a lot of life critical anatomy. And even um, behind it, you know, you've got the spinal cord and the spine. Now the mediastinum doesn't include the spinal column though. So it's this region right here is this cylinder with all of its important stuff. So here's the esophagus in the back. <clears throat> Here are the um, left and right main stem bronchi going to the lungs. Here are the great vessels, right? The pulmonary arteries and veins, the aorta, the superior vena cava, and then all the way in the front of the mediastinum is the heart. So the heart is very anterior. It literally sits underneath the breastbone. So underneath the sternum, there's a little space for the pericardial fluid here, but then there's heart right underneath. So it's one of the reasons why in trauma, um, particularly in projectile trauma, you know, like bullets, arrows, thrown objects, that the heart is sort of at risk of injury because other than the sternum, it doesn't have any other protection. It sits right there in the front, okay? Um, <clears throat> And then off to behind the heart are the great vessels, then the airways, and then the esophagus as you go front to back. Now what I also like to point out in this picture is the lungs, if the heart is in the front and the center, the lungs take up the whole left and right side of the chest. So when you look at a person, most of their chest is taken up by lung, not by heart. Okay, so the heart is just in the center, and then the lungs fill this whole space in the back. So, many of you will use a stethoscope to listen to patients' hearts and lungs. So, typically when we listen to the heart, we listen in the front, right? Because the heart is in the front, the easiest place to hear it. Now, we can listen to a few things in the back, but you hear best in the front. But when we listen to the lungs, we usually listen in the back. It's because most of the lung tissue is actually posterior to the midline. So, it's back here. So when you go to the doctor and he says, now sit up, I'm going to listen to your lungs, um, <clears throat> this, they're doing that because that's where most of your lung tissue is. It's in the back. So they're listening there. Okay. Now, another thing I like to point out in this picture is kind of a quirky primate thing. You know, we're primates in the end, and our rib cage definitely shows that fact. Because if you look at the human being, we are wider across than we are front to back. Right? If you look at your dogs, cats, cows, pigs, sheep, many of the other quadrupeds, they are wider front to back or top to bottom because they're like this, right? Then they are side to side. And that shows in the orientation of the heart. So one of the reasons that the human heart points to the left is as our rib cage got narrower front to back, well, the heart had to go somewhere. It had to move, and what it did is it rotated to the left, and we lost a, l a lung lobe, okay? So when we get to the respiratory chapter, I'll talk about this again. But the left lung has one fewer lobe than the right lung does, and that's to make room for the heart that had to shift to the left as we got narrower front to back. Well, why did we get narrower front to back in the first place? Probably has everything to do with cliffs and trees, Right? If you're narrow front to back, it's easier 
to climb either a tree or a, a cliff face because your center of mass is closer to the surface. So that's probably how we got that narrow front to back, wide side to side. And you see this in all of the, the primates. So you see it in you know, monkeys, chimpanzees, gorilla, and of course in us hairless primates, human beings. Right? Okay, so mediastinum, a little bit about heart evolution. <clears throat> okay, so the heart is in a bag. And you can see this. You see this black space right here? Well, that black space is not filled with air. It's filled with a small amount of slippery fluid. It's a little bit like thin, thin oil. It's very, very slick. And it, it fills this space that the heart lives in. So a classic example of the pericardium is like this. So imagine you've got a balloon. It's kind of floppy, but not totally filled. You can put your fist in the balloon, and the balloon will wrap around your fist. Well, that's kind of the anatomy of the pericardium. So this is your heart, right? Clinging to the outside of the heart is that slippery epicardium, OK? It's continuous with the outside of the bag, which is called the pericardium. So the heart lives in a pericardial sac. So we call that the pericardium, pericardial cavity. The, the tissue itself is called pericardium, and the sac is either called the pericardial cavity or pericardial sac. All right? Now, this pericardium, which is this, what the sac is made of, is a very thin but exceedingly tough membrane. You know, so many of you will have gotten an envelope, a Tyvek envelope, where you can't tear the stuff, right? You have to get the scissors out to open it because it won't tear. Pericardium is a lot like that stuff. It's very, very difficult to tear. It's very tough. And it provides some protection for uh, uh, damage to the heart because it's difficult to get into. But the principal reason that the heart lives in this bag is to give it freedom of movement. Okay, when we think of the heart, typically, we think that it just kind of contracts and it doesn't move very much. It, the heart actually turns as it contracts. So it, it twists and then relaxes and twists and twists and relaxes. So living in this pericardial sac means that the heart can move however it wants even though there are all these other tissues surrounding it, right? Because it's got this thin fluid in here, which means this can move differently than this or this or the skin overlying it. So it gives our heart freedom of motion. And it's pretty critical to uh, cardiac functioning. If the pericardial cavity is damaged and the heart gets stuck to it, you get cardiac failure or at least partial heart failure. Because when the heart can't twist, it can't empty as well. So we got to have this thing to live. It is also a spot in the body. Anytime you've got a space like this, there, a space is something that can be filled with something else. So in the heart, you can get infection in this space, or you can get inflammation in this space. We call that pericardi pericarditis. And you can end up even with blood in this space in the case of like massive trauma to the heart. This space can fill with blood under pressure. That blood squeezes the heart so it can't move, and you die. That's called a cardiac tamponade. So in the normal case, this pericardium doesn't do much, but it has some clinical significance that you guys will learn about later. So it's important to remember that it lives in that bag, and it means that it can contract and twist like it does. All right. Questions about any of that anatomy so far? Yes. I've heard of someone having to have their pericardium removed. They were really sick, and they had to eventually get a heart transplant. Yeah, that would be pretty sick. Um, but yes, they sometimes they'll remove it if it keeps filling up with fluid. Um, another thing we do is we can tap this space. So um, nowadays, we use an ultrasound machine, so we don't run the risk of poking into the heart. But you basically go in like this, and you enter the pericardial cavity, and you can draw up excess fluid or excess blood. Yeah. It's, um, it can have problems for lots of different reasons. So yeah, it does come up clinically with pericardium. Yeah. So when the pericardium only fill up with fluid, is there some type of like infection or? Typically, there has to be a cause. Yes. Okay. Um, anytime a, a body surface gets irritated, it tends to produce extra fluid. So like in the case of rheumatic heart disease, where the heart is um, being attacked by the immune system, 
you'll get pericarditis, where you'll have pericardial fluid that will build up. And then you either have to, you have to remove it typically until the patient gets better. Good. All right. Okay, so then we get to the, the pump itself. And you'll note down here, right? You should know all the anatomy on this slide, right? Heart is a critical organ. It is not the strongest evolutionarily of all of our organs. So heart disease comes up frequently, as you all know. You know, people die of heart attacks every day. So yeah, this anatomy is, is critical to know. Um, so we're looking at the external surface. So um, this is the front view. So if you take the rib cage off, this is the view you see. This is the back view, which you can really only see if you remove the heart. So you'll see that the vessels have been cut here so you can see the back. And like I said earlier, when you look at the front of the heart, most of what you see is the right side, okay? And, you know, so why don't we just call this the front and back in the human being? Because in um, anatomist terms, we try to keep the terms the same across all animals as much as we can. And really the only difference between our right side of the heart and an animal's right side is its position. So we still call it the right, okay? So we have the right atrium here and the right ventricle. The atria, there's one on each side, are quite thin walled and their job is to collect blood as it returns back to the heart. It pumps a little, but not very much. So it's a collector. The ventricles are the pumps. So the right ventricle is going to pump blood into the lungs. So you see the pulmonary trunk comes out of the right ventricle heading off to the lungs. And we see the uh, superior vena cava here. The inferior vena cava is behind here, which you see here. Um, and both of those empty into the right atrium. Okay, so right atrium, right ventricle, pulmonary trunk. Then on the front, we see a little bit of the left ventricle here. And you see how the left ventricle is, uh, comes lower down than the right ventricle? The left ventricle is significantly larger than the right almost two times as large in terms of muscle volume. Okay, so it's the big, big strong side of the heart. We'll talk about why that's true in a minute. So right ventricle, left ventricle. <clears throat> in between the ventricles, so here's right, here's left, we have this little kind of, uh, looks like a river of adipose tissue. Well, buried in that river are some important vessels, particularly the, uh, cor the left coronary artery, which I've got better pictures of later. But this area of fat, we call that the anterior, because it's in the front, interventricular, because it's between the ventricles, sulcus. A sulcus is just an indentation, okay? So this is the indentation between the ventricles in the front, anterior interventricular sulcus. And we'll see there's a coronary artery in there, so kind of a critical structure to know. All right. Um, okay, right atrium, right ventricle. Da, 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 da. All right, so now let's flip it around and look at the back. Well, the back view, we see a lot more detail of the great vessels here at the top. Okay, so um, to orient you, here's the right atrium, here's the right atrium. So we've taken it and we've flipped it around. Okay, so now the right is on the left hand, or on the, yeah, the, the right is on the opposite side. Okay. So here's the superior vena cava, here's the inferior vena cava. Note that there's like a straight line between them. If somebody were to hand you a heart and, tell, and say, where's the right atrium? The quickest, easiest way to figure that out, look for this straight line. Two vessels that are exactly in a row, you can put your finger through it. And that's going to be the superior and inferior vena cava. That means that's the right atrium that it's going into. So it can help to orient you between hearts. You're going to get to look at hearts in lab. Okay, I think you're going to do a sheep heart. I think you're going to look at a sheep heart in the lab. Um, and um, please remind Will, does he go by Will or Dr. Humphrey? Dr. Humphrey. Dr. Humphrey, okay. Um, remind him I have hearts, so um, human hearts for you guys to look at. So um, have him get them out of the cadaver lab because they're cool to look at. Okay, anyway. Superior, inferior, vena cava, right atrium. Here's the back of the right ventricle. And then because the left side of the heart is bigger than the right, we see more of it on the back side and we see some of it on the front side too. But most of the back of the heart, you know, two thirds, is the left side. 
So here's the left atrium. It's easy to identify because it has four holes going into it. Four pulmonary veins, two on the left, two on the right. So again, just like this straight line is an easy thing to identify, these four holes mean that that's the left atrium. There's no other part of the heart that has four symmetric holes going into it. Okay. The left atrium sits on top of the left ventricle, which is right here. And between the ventricles, we have a posterior interventricular sulcus, just like we have an anterior one here. Okay, so there's one in the front and there's one in the back. And then out of the left ventricle comes the aorta, so that's right here. Um, and the aortic arch goes up, and then you've got your brachiocephalic vein, and then your carotid artery and subclavian artery, like we learned last time, or for the last exam. Okay, so that's external surface of the heart. On the atria have these little pointy bits in the front. Here's one here and here's one here. We call those oracles. Oracle is another name for ear. So the floppy part of the outside sticking that your or your ears that stick out where your glasses go, that's we would call that oracle in Latin. So the atria have ears and they don't hear or anything like that, but they're just little floppy bits. So we call them oracles. All right, so external anatomy. <clears throat> so coursing along the external part of the heart are these arteries, which hopefully you have all heard of before, right? The coronary arteries are the arteries that supply the heart. And again, evolutionarily, they're not the strongest uh, uh, spot in our anatomy. They're small, the heart depends on them, so they cause trouble, okay? <clears throat> we have two coronary arteries that have branches. One comes off the right, one comes off the left. So you, this is the aorta, okay? The first two branches of the aorta are the left and right coronary arteries, okay? Good little tidbit to know, because sometimes that comes up on board exams and stuff. So what are the first two branches of the aorta? The coronary arteries are, okay? So the heart takes care of itself first. So the blood that it pumps is gonna go into the heart before it goes anywhere else, okay? So the right coronary artery heads around towards the back of the heart, okay? So it makes a beeline in a circle underneath the right atrium and heads around towards the back, which we'll pick up in the next slide. The left coronary artery in most people is larger and supplies more of the heart than the right does, okay? There are a few people whose right coronary artery is dominant, but most people's look like this. So that means the left coronary artery branches early. One branch goes down the front it, it, through that interventricular sulcus, and the anatomists call that the anterior interventricular artery. Anterior because it's in the front, interventricular because it's between the ventricles, artery because it's an artery. Now, everybody in clinical land, though, calls it this, the left anterior descending. Okay, so in your uh, clinical life, nobody's going to call it an anterior interventricular artery unless they're an anatomist or a very young cardiologist. Okay, so most people are going to call it the LAD. That means that you have to know both names. In the heart, there's a few things that have one, two, or even three names. You have to know both names or all three names, okay, because I want to clinically prepare you to get out there and know what people are talking about, okay? So the, in, the anterior interventricular is a branch of the left. So we call it the left anterior because it's in the front, descending because it goes down the front. So it goes down, so LAD. Now the other big branch of the left coronary artery is the left circumflex. Circum means circle, flex means to go um, or to bend. So this is bends in a circle. This is an artery that bends in a circle, which means it goes around the back. Um, and we'll pick it up on the other side. Okay. Now you'll notice that we're looking at the front part of the heart, and all of this area right here is all supplied by the left coronary artery. So a good rule of thumb, most of the front of the heart is supplied by the left, most of the back of the heart is supplied by the right coronary artery. Just because in when we talk about myocardial infarction or heart attack, we usually give a location. You know, is it an anterior MI, a posterior MI, a lateral MI, a medial MI? So a anterior myocardial infarction probably had to do with the left coronary artery, specifically the left anterior descending. 
The LAD is also known as the widow maker, right? Because the left anterior descending, when it clogs, typically it's a massive heart attack that may result in sudden death. So um, it's one of the more clinically relevant arteries in the body. Okay. Well, what about the backside? Okay, we flipped it around. Here is the circumflex artery coming from the left. It makes another bend down. Not in the sulcus, though. It bends down and goes down the side of the left ventricle. The left ventricle is so large that it basically has three independent blood supplies. The left anterior descending, the left marginal, and then the posterior intraventricular. So it has a lot of blood supply. So that's the continuation of the left. The continuation of the right coronary artery, it comes around the right atrium, and then it makes a V-line down that posterior interventricular sulcus, right? So here is the posterior interventricular artery, known by everybody else as the right posterior descending. So you've got a left anterior descending coming down the front, right? That's this guy. You have a posterior, right posterior descending going down the back. Those are typically the two big MI arteries, are the LAD and the, um, the uh, uh, right posterior descending. Sometimes the circumflex can be involved, but um, those are the two big ones. Okay, so those are the coronaries. And then with arteries, you have to have veins. The, um, okay, so here's the front of the heart. Most of the veins you see most easily from the back. But there's a big vein that goes with the um, left anterior descending here. We call that the great cardiac vein because it's the largest vein in the heart. It comes up. It goes around. This is it coming around here. And then it joins with this big tubular structure here called the coronary sinus. There's the posterior cardiac vein that goes along with that marginal artery. And then there's the middle cardiac vein that goes along with the right posterior descending that comes up. Now, the blood coming back from the heart drains directly into the right atrium. So there's a little hole just for it. So instead of going through the inferior vena cava or the superior vena cava, this blood empties right into the right atrium through its own little hole. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right. So cardiac veins. I thought I had a movie of cardiac veins. <coughs> Maybe I don't. Maybe I took it out. Hold on a minute. Ah. Uh, yeah, I must have taken it out. Okay, a little more anatomy, and then we'll uh, do some questions and get on to other stuff. All right, so now we take the front of the heart off in this case, and we're going to look on the inside. Now things get complicated, right? So the heart is a complex three-dimensional structure. The easiest way to remember all this anatomy is to take it one uh, uh, chamber at a time. So the heart has four chambers a left and a right atrium, a left and a right ventricle. And each of those chambers has some specific anatomy. Okay, so here's the right atrium right here, all right? So here's the superior vena cava. The inferior is down here. Do you see this arrow? Well, that's this arrow coming up here. Okay, so that's here. The right atrium has an oval indentation called the fossa ovalis. Um, that is a remnant of the fetal circulation. Um, at the end of this chapter, I'll talk to you a little bit about how our cardiovascular system functions totally differently when we're developing in the uterus than it does after we start breathing air, okay? And the reason for that is in the uterus, there's no point in, there's no uh, oxygen, there's no air, right? So there's no point in sending a bunch of blood to lungs that aren't next to any air. So the lungs are bypassed in the fetus for the whole fetal life. And then in the first 20 seconds after delivery, after the cord is cut, there's all these cardiovascular changes that have to happen to convert from the fetal circulation to the, to the adult circulation. So one of the remnants of that is this little guy, the fossa ovalis. Here is the opening of that coronary sinus, right? So on the other end of this, okay, is this. So blood coming back from the heart. And then at the bottom of the right atrium, we have this big opening here between the atria and the ventricles. Um, so that's, uh, and we'll talk more about the movement of things as we go here, but there's um, uh, the foramen there. Then blood goes into the right, 
ventricle, which is here. <clears throat> the right ventricle has a valve. Much more on that next time right, we're going. Um, we call that either the right atrioventricular valve or the tricuspid valve. Now, everybody in the world calls it the tricuspid valve, except anatomists who pick their own name. Okay, so tricuspid is what you're going to hear people say, but that's the right AV. In other words, atria, ventricle, so the valve between the atria and ventricle is the right atrioventricular valve. It has three cusps, or three pointy bits, so we call it the tricuspid, okay? Into the right ventricle we go, the tricuspid and the bicuspid have these little strings attached. Um, this has to do with how they work. These two valves essentially work like parachutes, so when they fill up, they close, and in order to keep the valve from flapping backwards, the strings have to be held on to, just like a parachute. If you don't hold the strings, you're going to die, right? Well, the strings are called chordae tendinae, or tendinous cords is what that, that Latin means. They're attached to little muscles. These are the hands that hold the cords that keep the parachute from um, flapping backwards and, and opening that valve. So the, uh, the muscles, we call those papillary muscles. So that's these guys right here. And then as blood leaves the right side of the heart, it goes through a valve that looks like this. We call that the pulmonary valve, okay? Or pulmonic valve is how most people say it, okay? So then blood goes out to the lungs here, comes back to the lungs here, and behind here you can't see it, but into the left atrium. From the left atrium, we go into the left ventricle. We've got another valve there. So left atrioventricular also called the bicuspid valve because it has two pointy bits, or mitral valve, so this one has three names, right? Called mitral valve because it looks a little bit like a miter hat, which I'm told is like a bishop's hat. It's sort of pointy like that, but it only has two bits that come together, and it looks like that, so they call it the mitral valve. That's what everybody calls it, or bicuspid. <clears throat> um, on the left side, there's papillary muscles again here and here, there's chordae tendinae around. And the trabeculi carnae, do you see how the, the inside of the heart is not smooth? It has these, this lattice work of muscle in it. You know, everybody thinks it's smooth in there, but it's not smooth at all. Well, that lattice work, we just call that trabeculi carnae, okay? Which means the scaffolding of meat. So that's a good one, right? Because meat is muscle and cardiac muscle is so. Yeah, trabeculae carnae. When you see the, I've got one heart in the cadaver lab that shows this really well because it's a sick heart. So you see big spaces in the trabeculae. And then ultimately blood from the left ventricle leaves through the aorta. There is a valve that looks just like this one underneath this one in the aorta. And that's the aortic valve. Okay, they don't show it because it looks just like this one does. All right. So today's been an anatomy day. So let's do some questions and then... We'll, uh, we'll probably call it a day. All right. So the ear-like extensions of the atrium is the, which of those? Uh, there. While you're answering, who has learned heart anatomy before sometime in your life? Okay, put your hand you good. That'll make it easier. Okay, best answer, ooh, 14 out of 14, yes, is D, oracle. So oracle is ear and little ear-like extensions. You should see that on the sheet part that you do, because um, they have pretty uh, profound oracles too. Okay, the circumflex branch and the anterior interventricular artery are branches of which of those?
I've got 20 of you in here, but only 15 logged in. Is somebody having trouble getting logged in? Oh, that's okay. No, you don't get it out. I just was asking to see if it was a tech problem or a... All right, five seconds, jump in there, last few people. All right, we got a 75-25 split between A and B. Best answer there is B. The left coronary artery is usually larger and supplies more of the heart than the right does. Um, so it has really three main branches, the anterior interventricular, which all normal people call the left anterior descending, the um, circumflex branch, um, which goes around, and then the marginal artery, which comes down sort of the center of the left ventricle. All right, yeah. Okay, the bicuspid, also known as the mitral valve, is located where? I think that's all of you that are playing anyway. So the best answer there is E. So the third name for that valve is the left atrioventricular valve, or left AV valve. Um, and it's found between the left atrium and the left ventricle. And it has two pointy bits, so we call it the bicuspid. Okay, that is all for today.